Hello again, economic students. I hope you're all well and you are getting some great study done and getting prepared for your English exam next week. Students continue to ask me about how much information about the current economy they need to know to be successful in the exam. And so I thought I'd put this little video together just to help you out last minute. Of course, there are five or six dot points in the study design, which state over the past two years, which is an indicator to you as a student that you need to make your answer contemporary. In other words, you have to answer in a way that reflects what actually happened in the economy rather than in theory. And I'm going to go through those dot points now. So let's get into it. The first dot point talks about, well, it's actually a key skill. It says you need to be able to evaluate the extent to which the economy has achieved its domestic macroeconomic goals. And that's over the past two years. And then discuss the effect of that on living standards. Well, we can do that part. So let's think about evaluating the extent to which we've achieved our macroeconomic goals. By now, you should know your three macroeconomic goals. You should know their measurements, Nairu, real GDP, in the inflation rate. And once you know that, well, you compare that to the current rate of unemployment, which is 3.7%, so below neutral, have we achieved our goal? Yes, of course, we have achieved our goal. In fact, we've overachieved our goal. If I can get my mouse working here, I'll write that in there. We've overachieved our goal. Now, some students may have been taught that we have not achieved our goal because it's too low. That's fine as long as you add in the inflation part. So the reason we haven't achieved it is not because of the low unemployment rate. The reason we haven't achieved it is because it's creating inflationary pressure. Remember, jobs are good. Low unemployment is good. Strong and sustainable growth. Well, the target is 3 to 3.5% real GDP. It's currently 2.1, so it's below. So the answer would be no. Although you could make an argument that it's being strong enough to create jobs, but not sustainable. So it's up to you which way you take it. Low and stable inflation. We want 2 to 3% on average. It's 6%. It's above. It's definitely a no. We have not achieved our goal of low and stable inflation. The difficulty becomes when you might have to evaluate the extent to which we've achieved a goal. Now, evaluating in economics means to look at on the one hand and on the other hand. So two sides to an argument. For our goals, we basically have to be able to state how have we achieved the goal and how have we not achieved the goal? So if we go through full employment here, as I said, we've overachieved it because the unemployment rate is low. So this is good because unemployment is low. However, as I said before, a low unemployment rate creates wages growth and that puts upward pressure on inflation and that's bad for the goal. Okay, So an evaluating question would ask you to do both those things. Strong and sustainable growth, well, on the one hand, it's strong enough to create jobs, which is what the strong goal is all about. And actually, if you went back over the past two years, part of those two years, we have actually achieved it because last year, the rate was 3.1%. So that could be your argument for the achievement. The non-achievement is, as we stated before, it's 2.1, so it's below the 3, .3 to 3.5% real GDP target. Inflation is high, so it's not sustainable, and the environment is being destroyed. So you can make any of those arguments. Low and stable inflation is a little bit tricky. Clearly, it's too high, 6%. We definitely haven't achieved it. But if you had to, if Vika forced you to make an argument for how we have achieved it, there's a couple of ways you could do this. You could talk about the monthly rate of inflation, which is slowing. And that create that that's a different measure for inflation, but that is showing a lower rate of inflation. You could also talk about the trend. So we used to be at 8%, now we're at 6%. So we're moving towards 2 to 3%. It's not a great argument. Or you could even say, on average, over a cycle, inflation has been achieved. So even though we've had two period, two years of very high inflation, well, if we go back five years, it was low inflation. So it all evens out. I don't think that's a great argument. I don't think VCAR should ask you to evaluate low and stable inflation, but you never know. So what's the exam question that they could ask you? Evaluate the extent to which we've achieved strong and sustainable growth or any of our goals. And how do we do this? We first have to define the goal so we can then make the evaluation. So what's the goal? Bring in the knowledge of the current data, which we had in the other slide, and then outline how we have achieved the goal and how we haven't achieved the goal. And that would be your four marks. Could be done for any goal. The next dot point is about the aggregate demand and aggregate supply factors. And I think year in, year eight, year out, students forget to do these because they're at the bottom of macroeconomics. And usually teachers are just trying to get through the theory of macroeconomics because it's a bit dry at first. And they forget to bring in the contemporary factors. It's okay, we're going to do them now. And it makes sense to do them now because they change. So 
First of all, you don't need to know all of them. You only need to know, in my opinion, one AD positive factor and one AD negative factor and the same for aggregate supply. So the other thing is you definitely don't need to know the precise data. You don't need to know the consumer confidence was 62.7 index points. And you don't need to know that the exchange rate was 63.8 US cents. Just know the trend. Just know the trend and that'll help you to answer the question. So let's go through them now. The exchange rate has been depreciating, uh, which is uh, good for international competitiveness, so good for aggregate demand. It's a positive AD factor, but it's actually a negative AS factor because, oops, because um, firms who import intermediate goods and capital from overseas, that increases their cost of production. So straight away, if you remember the exchange rate is decreasing, you've got a positive AD and a positive AS factor, which you could use. Disposable incomes have been increasing. If we put inflation to the side for now, an increase in disposable incomes would stimulate AD, so another positive AD factor. Consumer confidence has very clearly been trending down, so it's lowest point ever, I think, because of the RBA's tightening cycle and how quick they've increased interest rates, so a negative AD factor. Productivity growth, which is linked to the unit labor costs, these are two negative AS factors, but they're linked together. Uh, unit costs are increasing or unit labor costs are increasing and that's actually linked to this decrease in productivity. Ugh, I can't get my mouse. Um, this, this is linked to this. It's a decrease in productivity. We get less out of our workers, which means per hour we have to pay them more to produce the same stuff. Uh, remember the other way around is true too if productivity is improving, but that's not what's happening in the economy. So two negative AS factors. Positive AS factor is the participation rate. More and more people have been joining the labor market, most likely due to the fact that it's a very strong labor market and people are getting jobs that perhaps they otherwise wouldn't in a weaker labor market. So that's a positive AS factor. You could also talk about population growth, skilled migration, all those sorts of things. In terms of the terms of trade, we have a decrease in commodity prices, which is leading to a decrease in the terms of trade. And if you wanted to think about the terms of trade as an AS factor, which I probably wouldn't, you could say that import prices have been uh, de uh, increasing as well. So that's also a bad or a negative AS factor. But do remember, just as a side point, it's the commodity prices that drive the terms of trade in Australia. What's the kind of questions that you could get asked and why did I put you through all this stuff? Well, I think some of the really difficult questions on the past papers have been around this stuff. So have a look at this question. And what do we have to do in this question? Well, we basically have to put ourselves in the shoes of Michelle Bullock. She's sitting at the head of the RBA governor's um, board meeting. They're looking at all the different economic variables or economic factors in the economy. They're looking at the positives, um, the tailwinds for the economy, which is bad for inflation. And then they're looking at the things that are slowing down the economy or the headwinds, which is good for inflation. And they're trying to work out, well, what do we do next? Because they've said, hey, more recently, further interest rates are coming, further interest rate rises are coming, you need to bring in two, a two factors, one AD and one AS, that would justify that. And so this question is basically asking you, what are two factors, one AS, one AD, that are stimulating growth and creating inflation? Or oh, sorry, the AS factor wouldn't stimulate growth, it would just create inflation. So any of the ones that I just went through, and then you link that to how or why Michelle Bullock is saying, I'm going to keep interest uh, raising interest rates. A more simpler way of asking that would just be like explain 1AD and 1AS factor which has influenced the achievement of the government's goal of low and stable inflation. Now the reason that that's a bit more simple is it doesn't ask you to bring in unconventional policy so that's the first part. Secondly it says has influenced. So what you could do here is just say well a decrease in consumer confidence has actually put downward pressure on AD and that would have put down pressure on prices. So it has influenced inflation to decrease. So you don't have to actually justify the current inflation rate. You just have to say, well, what could be influencing prices? Okay, the next dot point here is about the budget and budget initiatives. So we need to have some contemporary information here. We've got the budget surplus, which was predicted to be $4.2 billion, but it actually ended up being over $20 billion mainly because of the tight labor market, which led to more revenue for the government and commodity prices. You can see we've gone from a pretty big deficit to a surplus. So this is a contractionary stance for the budget. Now, remember, you do also need to think about it as a percentage of GDP, but we won't do that now. 
Now, a bit of an extension here. Remember, the stance technically is talking about the structural component of the budget. So if we isolated the structural changes to the budget, that would indicate what the government's actually trying to do to the economy. We'd need to get rid of all the automatic stabilizers because that's not really reflective of what the RBA, sorry, of what the government's trying to do. If you've learned it this way, just remember that. If you haven't, don't worry about it now. It's just an extension. So automatic stabilizers, well, we've kind of got these two periods. We've got these two, two periods in the economy. Uh, if we take that two year um, window that the RBA, that VCAR asks you to focus on, and we've got kind of this, well, it's decreasing growth, but this is a fairly strong part of the economy late 2021 to 2022. Uh, and then we've kind of got more recently this slowdown in economic growth. So when you talk about economic stabilizers, it will be usually asking you to explain how they stable uh, or how they smooth out the business cycle. In order to do that, you first need to talk about which phase of the business cycle is the economy in. And because it's two years, you can pick. So in a contraction or a downturn, uh, more tax revenue will be, sorry, more welfare will be paid as more people uh, uh, become eligible for welfare payments and less tax is taken out of the economy as less people have jobs or wages. Now, there's a very little extra side point here. Remember that even though the economy is contracting here, the unemployment rate is actually still super low. So that if you wanted to add extra flavor, you would say, well, even though the economy is contracting, Automatic stabilizers are probably not working in the way that they usually would because the labor market is strong. You do need to have two discretionary uh, discretionary budgetary policies up your sleeve. There are heaps of them that increase aggregate demand. Any of the spending policies, infrastructure, um, bill relief, all that sort of stuff. There is only really one policy that decreases AD and that's in simple terms, it's an increase in the tax rate on superannuation balances for people who, let's face it, have too much money in super, over $3 million in super, then are going to get taxed at a higher rate. And that will, in theory, lead to less income in the economy, less spending. So two discretionary policies from the past two years. Now, with these discretionary policies, the uh, VCAR could ask you to explain how these policies work to affect a goal. Or what I think is a more difficult question is to evaluate the budgetary policies over the past year. And I would highly encourage you to include in a question like this, um, to include a contemporary reference. So you might say something like, one strength of budgetary policy is it can target areas of weakness in the economy. Then you'd make the standard uh, argument to low inflation, but then you'd bring in, for example, the bill relief that the government introduced over 2022-23 is an example of this. And the same for weaknesses. Okay, the stance of monetary policy. Remember that the stance of monetary policy is determined by this neutral rate here. So just because, just because the interest rate is increasing over this part of the last two years, just because it's increasing, we would call that a tightening but it's not a contractionary stance until it goes above the neutral rate. So that's more recently over this year, maybe like the eight, last eight or 10 months. So remember when VCAR asks you over the past two years, you've got some freedom and scope to pick which part of the last two years you wanna focus on. And that might help you to answer tricky questions. So more recently, the stance is definitely contractionary, but over 2022, uh, and to the end of 21, it was expansionary. Pretty standard question about how monetary policies works to help achieve the goal. Remember, if you got asked this question, you would have to state the target cash rate and the stance to prove that. So the stance and the target cash rate to justify the stance. And then you just use your standard transmission mechanism argument. The final one is the example of unconventional monetary policy. So it does need to be contemporary. You can't just know these things in theory. And so what I would advise you to do is to think about forward guidance and the things that Michelle Bullock, Bullock and uh, Phil Lowe have been saying. In a nutshell, they've been saying, if inflation does not return to the two to 3% band that is our target rate, then we will continue to raise interest rates. So they're using their forward guidance to slow down aggregate demand and to discourage spending and encourage saving in the households and businesses. Now, if you wanted to, if you're a bit 
economics mad and you want to talk about bond buying, well, the RBA is not buying any more bonds and they certainly haven't over the past two years. So I'd be very careful talking about quantitative easing. What they've actually been doing over the past two years is quantitative tightening. But have a look at that if you want to do bond buying, but I would imagine most of you would do forward guidance. Now there's the question that you could get asked about unconventional monetary policy. I've just chucked in the charter there because sometimes VCAR does that to try and confuse you. But remember, it's just a three macroeconomic goals. And that is it for me. So one last buy for now for 2023. Thank you so much to everybody that reached out and said thank you over the year. Uh, when I started recording these, I really did not expect so many people to watch them. So thank you and please do pass them on to students for next year if you think they will find it helpful. Bye for now.